Oh, there we go. Hello, everyone. And my video just cut out. Um, we are in, going to start chapter 10 today. Uh, God willing. Uh, we just, well, two weeks ago, we finished up chapter nine. Last week in our live class, we started talking about something different. Um, the different Gadarim, different categories of non-Jews. Uh, this week, uh, we're going to start on chapter 10 and let's, uh, try to fix the S the, the text, the ratio. Hopefully that'll be good. Um, okay. We're in the Tanya. We're in our Tanya class. Likute Amarim, the very first part of, uh, the Tanya. And we finished chapter nine. We're going on to chapter 10. Uh, we're going to be reading from uh habad.org thank god they have a free version of lessons in tanya which is what we're actually reading from excuse me there's a book called lessons in tanya which is uh has commentaries by rabbi yosef weinberg on the tanya uh very cool because it teaches us a bit about hasid alam the kind ones of the peoples of the world um and without it most people wouldn't know that such a thing existed uh, you can go to, I think it's the 14th or 15th video of the series and go to chapter one there. Um, we started on a completely different part. There's a whole series here. So if you miss or if you can't make it, we upload it to YouTube and you can watch the whole series uh, in sequence. And uh, my camera is goofing up on me, so you might not be able to see me. Uh, where are we? So let's, uh, we're going to uh, chapter um, nine. How do I maximize this? Oh, uh, chapter nine. Uh, we finished chapter nine. We're talking about the Nefesh Elokit, the Nefesh Elokis, the godly soul, which its desire is to subdue the Nefesh Behemoth, the Nefesh Behemoth, the animal soul. The nefesh behemot, the animal soul, desires the opposite. It wants to uh, trick and subdue the nefesh elokit, the godly soul. And uh, however, deep down, the nefesh behemot, it secretly desires to be subdued by the nefesh elokis. So it actually really does secretly wish to be subdued by that nefesh elokis. That's how chapter nine wraps up. Um, so we're going to go on to chapter 10. Um, do, do, do. Chapter 10. After elaborating in the previous chapter on the ongoing battle between the divine and animal soul over mastery of a Jew's body, of a Yisrael's body, the Alter Rebbe now proceeds to explain that one who vanquishes his animal soul and transforms its evil into good is a tzaddik. Oh, wow. Um... So I'm wondering here, this is a question I have. So the klipat noga soul, the soul that derives from the klipa noga, which has an element of good and evil, is it saying here that that evil can also be transformed? But that's my question. Um, I don't know if he's going to answer it. Uh, this level of tzaddik comprises two general categories. The perfect tzaddik, also called the tzaddik who knows only good, is he who has transformed all the evil of his animal soul to good. Uh, I think he's answering it here. While he who has not completely eradicated and converted the evil within himself, within him is termed an imperfect tzaddik and a tzaddik who knows evil i.e. possesses some vestige of evil. The difference between the two sets of descriptive terms, complete and incomplete, Sadiq, 
and the tzaddik who knows only good or who knows evil is as follows. The former set describes the degree of the tzaddik's love of God, for it is this love that earns for him the title tzaddik. In the case of the complete tzaddik, it is a complete and perfect love, while the love of the incomplete tzaddik is imperfect. The latter set of terms refers to the conversion of the animal soul's evil to good. An individual in whom it has been entirely transformed is termed a tzaddik who knows only good, whereas one in whom a vestige of evil remains is termed a tzaddik who knows evil. It goes without saying that evil in this context refers only to the promptings of evil that may be harbored in his heart. Not, of course, to actual evil expressed in thought, speech, or action. So, <clears throat> most a lot of uh, words in Hebrew you can't just skip over. There's not a lot of colloquialisms in what the sages say and write and things like this. Like, for instance, in the Rambam. Usually every phrase, every single like uh, word has a specific reason why it's mentioned. So the fact that it says uh, evil that may be harbored in his heart, this, I'm not taking this as a colloquialism. This could actually allude to something where there is evil in the heart and not expressed in thought, speech, or action. When a person causes his divine soul to prevail over the animal soul, Magbir amplifying. And, um, and when he wages war against the animal soul to the extent that he banishes and eradicates its evil from its abode within him, namely the left part of the heart. Interesting. Now we talked about the different chambers of the heart. There was a right and a left. I think Hesed. What is it? Um, the Nefesh Elokis, it, not only does it sit on the Seichel, the intellect, but there is a chamber. I think it's the right chamber of one of the ventricles of the heart that it resides in. James, may I add something here from sure. the Shulstein? Yeah. <clears throat> this is the complete setup. Poses no evil. The existence of evil is like that of falsehood. There is no such thing as under, utter falsehood. No lie can be sustained unless it contains a grain of truth. And when the lie is refined, when the element of truth is extracted from the embodiment of falsehood, the false embodiment disappears completely. And one is left with a full uh, luminous truth. This is the point of transition from the level of incomplete Siddiq to the level of complete Siddiq. The point at which evil is transformed completely into good at that point, the person should feel as if the vital forces of his soul have been doubled, more than doubled, because the animal soul derives, derives, dot, drives are more passionate than those of the divine soul. All that he has done in the past seems to pale into the insignificance compared to what he can do now, because now he has found the ultimate resolution to the struggles of life. The very nature of reality is transformed for him, and he functions totally as a different person. That said there are two levels, and it goes on about that. But so what you're saying, and I think it's the left side of the heart, is what has the animal soul. So when this, when they have come together and it has been decreased, that's what you're saying is when, when we, we, we derive to be a Sadiq. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's that first interaction with the Nefesh, the, of the Nefesh Elokis interaction with the Nefesh Bahamas is in that left side of the heart. Everything from that right side goes into the left or some such i guess it depends on which perspective he's talking about but uh i'm assuming it's that first initial part of the heart uh which is would be the side of chesed going into the side of gurura mm. 
This That's is very scary right here. It says the complete Zedek res re requires no such control. He can give free reign to his desires because he his desires always reflect the will of Hashem. He requires no direction because all directions are his psychic might. Take her holy. Such a person does not inhabit a world where both good and evil are possible because his entity is a is the Markava, a vehicle for godliness. So, but we're in that other world where we have that battle of the good and evil. Right. And it, it's, it begins in the heart, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. As it as is written, and you shall eradicate the evil from your midst, which implies that one. Oh, we just read that. Which implies that one. Oh, no, no, we're not in Devar yet. Uh, which implies that one ought to eradicate the evil within within himself. The person who has in fact eradicated evil from his heart has not only banished the external practical expression of evil evil thoughts words or actions but has eradicated the evil itself it has no place in his heart he no longer desires evil as to one who achieves this goal but finds that the evil has nevertheless not actually been converted into good in which case his entire capacity for desire would now be directed only toward good and holiness, since with him this is not the case. He is called an incomplete tzaddik. He is also called a tzaddik who knows evil, meaning that some vestige of evil still lingers within him, in the left part of his heart, except that it finds no expression at all, not even in evil desires, because the evil, by reason of its minuteness, is subjugated and nullified by the good and cannot therefore be sensed. So it's there, but it's just like the Nefesh Elokis bypasses it. Hence, the Tzaddik may imagine that he has driven it out and he and it has quite and it has quite disappeared. In truth, however, had all the evil in him departed and disappeared. It would have been converted into actual good. I don't know. I wonder if we should read this footnote. The Rebbe remarks, there are actually two aspects to the evil nature. The power of the animal soul and its filthy garments, the evil desires into which the animal soul's energy has been channeled. These garments cannot be elevated or converted. They must be removed and eradicated. Ah, this helps answer my question in depth. The energy of the animal soul and its tendency to find evil outlets for its energy can then be converted to good by clothing it in clean garments. So you can change your garments, so to speak, uh, which is probably the uh, allegory here, um, i.e. channeling this energy into holy outlets. If the energy has not yet been transformed into good, clearly some of the filthy garments must have been remained. Oh. Ernestine's trying to get in. I think I think Ernestine got dropped or something. There you go. Hi, Ernest, er, Ernestine, you're back. Sorry if you were trying to get in and I wasn't letting you in. I'm sorry. I'm not always looking at that screen. Hey, Ernestine. That's okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Your video's on too, by the way, just in case. Um, you can do what you want, but uh, and, uh, let's hear in okay so that kind of answers my question so there's a potentiality we kind of talked about this last week i thought there was like and this still could be the case i could be mis misunderstanding but i thought i thought the klipa noga had good and evil like in it um but this appears to be saying it just has the potential. It's how we clothe the energy that we get from the Klippa Noga. That's, that kind of seems what it's saying. I could be wrong, but... The uh, Rabbi Steinsaltz says here, the existence of evil is like is that of falsehood. There is no such thing as utter falsehood. 
No lie can sustain unless it contains a grain of truth. And, uh, and when the lie is refined, that is the element of truth is uh, extracted from its embodiment of falsehood. Uh, so th they do have both of them within it into some, some degree as uh, because nothing is uh, never totally on the negative. It has to have some light within it in order for it to be sustainable. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, James. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the uh, the idea of the klipa no good, doesn't the the klipa touch the good and the bad? Uh, it appears to me, yes. Yeah. So, um, the, uh, just by by its nature, it. It, it is embraced by good and bad, but, I mean, the Khuzari, uh, the rabbi explains it to the king that um, a, a true tzaddik is like a, a, a city that has his citizens under control and by citizens, you know, the, the desires, the particular desires that right. form part of. Am I am I on the right path? Do you think? Or? Yeah, well, it actually he talked about that in the in the previous chapter in chapter nine. He says uh, it's like conquering a city, and who's going to desire to conquer it? And the nef, and he kind of refers to this as a war earlier on, I believe. Uh, you shall, yeah. He wages a war against the animal soul. Um. I don't know if that's the literal Hebrew. No, um, it's a war. That's not my understanding in Hebrew at war. I'll have to look at that further. I don't want to waste your time. But um, yeah, he refers to that like, you know, in a warlike way, um, it's subduing a city. And there's like a king in the city and things like this. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I would call it like if it touches good and evil or if it's comprised. It, it, it's a question of what actually is evil. Does evil really exist or is it a layer, a mis, mis goodness, if that makes sense? Mis closed like, goodness. That's yes. a pretty interesting way of saying it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I don't know else how to how to put that, but um, so um, my USB is freaking out. I think I'm just going to detach it before anything weird happens. Okay. Uh, in truth, however, had all the evil in him departed. Was here. Are we? Have we already talked about this? We were talking about footnotes. We were in a footnote, weren't we? Three, yeah, but no three. Thank you. Uh, the energy, I'm in the middle here. The energy of the animal soul and its tendency to find evil, its tendency, because the, the doesn't it say that even the, the nefesh, uh, excuse me, the klipat noiga is mostly consists of what's what what they call evil to find so its tendency is to find evil outlets for its energy can then be converted to good by clothing it in clean garments i.e channeling this energy into holy outlets so you got to like reclothe it basically if the energy has not yet been transformed into good clearly some of the filthy garments must have remained okay so you have to change the garments, how we express our soul. It's like a filter. It's like light. I, I, view, I view it like this. It's like light. There's uh, something called pure light. And if you don't put it through the prism properly, it's not going to do anything or it could even be harmful. Like you, 
but if you if you channel it in a certain way it'll light up the room and it'll it'll be do good things that's kind of how um, i see it um i'm not sure if the even though their alter ebby calls things evil i'm not exactly sure if that exists like that we lost the ernestine again i don't know if she's having connection issues um, this required this requires explanation perhaps the incomplete sadiq <clears throat> in other words what i'm saying is i'm wondering if it's more of saying instead of saying good and evil it maybe it's more of a pure and impure type thing <clears throat> uh, this requires explanation perhaps the incomplete sadiq feels no desire for evil because he indeed no longer has any evil having converted it to good we must say that he only imagines himself to be altogether free of evil to explain this the alter Ebi continues with the clarification of the term complete sadi the explanation in brief as stated in the previous chapter the complete sadi is able to convert his evil to good only by dint i don't know what that means never heard that in he in english by dint of his great love of god i've never heard dent the word dent used this way uh, a love known as love of delights accordingly the incomplete sadiq who has yet to attain to this lofty level of love has obviously not yet accomplished this conversion love of delights then is the ultimate criterion where the sadiq stands vis-a-vis -vis the eradication of evil in the alter Ebi's words the explanation of the matter is as follows uh, the by the ur the commentary the biur biur ha inyan very cool so these are two common words like you might hear like biur halacha uh biur mishna okay and the inyan uh, you've heard inyan the concept What's the Indian? Um, a complete Sadiq is in whom the evil has been converted into good and who is con consequently called a Sadiq who knows only good. He attained this level by completely removing his filthy garments from evil. James, do you want to know what the word dent means? Yes, please. I almost asked that. Okay, hold on. It means to make a blow or a stroke as far like a force, a violent force. Yeah, to dent something. I understand mm -hmm. that. But what do you think it means? Um... A dent by argument or imp importunity. Yeah, what's that? It's a result of something. It's a, it's a passion. It's, it's oh the, very good yeah i don't think that's an american english like colloquialism i'm wondering if the rabbi who wrote this may might be from uh from uh, like a british or british commonwealth or some such might be in more of an english english i don't know uh, by dint of his great love impression of his great yeah life. yeah exactly that's what i think would be an american english okay. yeah just had a hard time with that one thanks uh -huh. I've, ha I've i've had in lessons in tiny i've had some kind of reaction to that and with other commentaries uh just uh it, 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 the way it, it's written i'm like that's an uh, interesting way to write that <laughs> Um, so the explanation of the matter is as follows. The complete Sadiq in whom the evil has been converted into good and who is consequently called a Sadiq who knows only good. Sadiq Vitovlo. Is, uh, is this the idea, are they talking about the idea of, of uh, your, 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 turning your sins into merits to where it's open? Yeah, I don't know. 
I, I don't, you know, people say that kind of stuff. And I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't know what that means. Sins into merits. I don't know exactly what that means, but I'm wondering if this is what it's kind of. The Baal was... HaShalom, the, the uh, Rabbi Ashlaw talks about it, goes in, explains it. It's just been a, and I keep waiting for this to come up because it just seems like it's going in there. And I've, I've picked up on things in here uh, from Rabbi Ashlaw. So I'm just, I was kind of waiting. I didn't know. Uh, yeah. But this, what it seems like it's going to happen is he's going to come up in here and he's going to explain. It's going to be like that. But um, uh, I, it's been so long since I've, I've been in uh, any Rabbi Ashlaw stuff, I can't really articulate yeah, this concept. The, the actually, of, Lashon that he's using, yeah. the language that he's using. Yeah. I could be. Um. See, I would, I would say, if, if that is the context, I wouldn't say turn your sins into merits, even though this might be what it is. I would say the, the energy that you used to sin is converted now into doing it for good, if that makes sense. Wouldn't that be the same thing as turning it into merits? Because you used to be using that energy for the bad, and now you've turned that energy toward the good so now you've changed your whole lifestyle so it's turned into merits well, instead they, of sin. well they say that that function means that you can then it's better like you're more of a sadic because of it now the now i'm gonna play like devil's advocate so to speak then i said well then why don't you just do a whole bunch of sinning and then just convert all those sins into merits and you'll be even more than sadic right that doesn't sound right that's why I'm wondering if it means converting the energy that you use to sin, which was maybe you had such a great energy and you sin so much, you're now taking that energy that was so powerful and now you're converting it into the side of good. That makes more sense with, in the context of chapter nine. Yeah. We we're talking about unclean foods and the energy of that food right. and, and things like that. So it's probably following more along those lines. Yeah. But there's still a, a dynamic of this or this idea uh, of, of wind up doing something yeah. that is uh, even, even, because it's what it's talking here about the Saudi, because it's not, it's not making sense unless. All of the, the the evil that this Sadiq has done is eradicated, or else why would he be a Sadiq? He would be a, he would be a Sadiq Rasha. Right, and maybe that's why the next book that we would read is uh, Teshuva. I think uh, just uh, just on um, converting uh, evil to good, uh, I've had it explained to me that. Uh, Say if you have a desire to be a uh, uh, a murderer and spill blood, then turning it over to a, a pure sense, you could be a, a shepherd, something like that. You know? Oh you right, know? I've heard that before. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And see, that would be different. That's that would uh, Stephen. That's uh, that's how I would view what's being talked about. I still don't understand. And I'm ignorant in this, maybe. Like, I still don't understand the whole turning sins into merits. I don't understand that. I don't understand how that mechanics of that works. I can understand the power converting the power that you use to sin into using that power to do good deeds, you know, merits and clothing it. But I don't understand if once it's literally made man manifest, how you would then convert it into, you know, how, how would you convert bad fruit into good fruit? I just mm -hmm. don't. I, I wonder if it'd be uh, 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 mitigating it, you know, you did more good than evil. The same, you know, like, uh, I, you know, to where the good that you did mitigated the evil that you've done, which would be, uh, which right. makes sense with the idea of uh, between, you know, the, the the good and bad and going, you know, yeah. uh, to, to do more good than you do evil. Right. Uh, what do we do? And I think that's, uh, besides, that's, that sounds, that sounds like the ball, Ashulam's uh, yeah. talking about uh, going, uh, uh, when you go to the court of heaven to bring, to bring more good deeds than you do bad deeds in there, because that turns, uh, 
that mitigates it and turns everything into good because right. But it's still, but if you look at net net, you're still gonna. It's still better to do just good deeds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like I, I'm not trying to be. I'm I'm, I'm trying not to be a stickler again. Like I just literally do not. I I need someone to explain. And now is probably not the time. It's probably out of the domain, out of the scope. I know people probably don't want to listen to it, but. I would, you know, I would be open to listening the whole merits turning uh, bad deeds or sins into merits. I would I would listen to a, a, if, a class on that just to understand w- the mechanics. I literally do not understand. It just doesn't make sense to me. Like, from a, like, James, a, excuse me, wouldn't it kind of be like what we've all gone through? We, we have, we, all went through uh, being uh, less than perfect, less than perfect, and 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 putting a, the a man as God, and now we're trying to undo that, and trying to do Torah, and trying to do more mitzvahs, and trying to do everything, eradicating the evil. Uh, that we did while we were uh, uh, like, like it creates like a slingshot effect. Yeah, yeah, I could, I could kind of see that because you know no one's bur- uh, born perfect, and we don't all come to the Torah at the same age. Yeah, and there's a lot of things in our in our background that has that we did before right. we ever came to Torah. Right. Yeah, it's kind of like one of those things, maybe like in life, like my dad, uh, a lot of times it's not the, quite the same topic, but um, I get, I thank God uh, it's a blessing. I get to work with my dad and he, you know, he'll say like, man, I had it so rough. And he did. He had a really rough childhood. Uh, he very like poor and stuff and he lived in a poor part of town. But that's like one of the reasons why he's so motivated and he does so well at business. And, you know, he, you know, say like kids these days, they just don't know what hard work is. And of course, it's kind of cliche, but but it's true. Like if you've never went hungry for days on end, you don't know what it means to to work hard for a meal and things like this. So and uh, kind of like that, maybe. Um, so. Could it be that it, it's not so much the the sinners? Um, you know, we always focus on the sinners' sin, but but we should focus on Hashem's compassion and love uh, to give that person another chance. Like if we done something wrong, we want somebody to give us a chance. So yeah. it's more of it's not so much the sin, but the compassion and the love and the forgiveness that comes from Hashem through to us right. so we can help that soul. That's yeah. my two cents. Getting getting slingshotted basically out of that side, the side of like evil, the side of like that harsh din and gavura, which has an element of finitude it seems to be finite when it comes to the spirituality of things but yeah. has said seems to be that right side seems to be in an infinite it is the long pillar the left side is the shorter pillar it does not encapsulate encompass everything i think the word evil is what's thrown us off because it's, there's all kinds of levels of evil right you know and so what we what we did or, or what we've done on a, and is stuck there on the left side uh, might not have really been evil evil or, you know like murder or anything like that it could have just been a, a, a lesser evil right of gossiping and 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 blasphemy and things like that right. Which 
Yeah. It says here, it says, you know, uh, the key to spiritual evolution is the intention behind the actions. A sin or a negative action is typically rooted in self selfishness or a desire to receive uh, oneself for, for receive for oneself alone, which is the verbiage of the Baal HaShalom, uh, to receive for yourself alone. When a person undergoes a deep spiritual transformation and changes their intention from self selfishness to altruism, even past actions can then be uh, recontextualized, redone, re, re, uh, transformed, and transformed into merits uh, once you su uh, uh, succeed in doing it for the sake of heaven. And, and understanding what that is and your actions to do for that. It even, it, it's, it's so um, meritorious to do that. But we're not saying that sin, sinning for the sake of heaven, but looking back in the past and trying to rectify those things, learning from them and things like that. Is that what he's saying? It, it's, um, it, it's, in other words, the action of, of converting from this this uh, selfish state yeah. into a into a one that, that's 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 uh, uh, giving for the sake of heaven for yeah. no for no merit for your own self yeah. is so is so profound that it negates the negative actions that the sin uh, ever existed. Okay, because so. So somebody sins a sin against you or other people, and you say something to the effect of, oh, my goodness, I hope one day they repent, they do teshuva, and they realize what they have done, and they try and make it right. And then when they do do the, that, when they do teshuva, then you say, wow, uh, thank God they see, saw the error of their ways, and now they are doing things for the sake of heaven that would be the way I, I, the way i'm understanding it. that'd be the way Hashem sees it not like it, we would see it right. would see, he, he sees nothing but that that um that turnaround and 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 so it's as if at that point that his sins were uh, all turned into merits because that's all Hashem sees is the merits now okay okay and it's, it's directly con uh, connected with um Teshuvah. And teshuvah is the same idea. Is is once you truly repent, that's what happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, because that makes you know, more sense. Yeah. So maybe I think the word repentance, if we plug that into our thinking, it would start making a lot more sense to us. Yeah. Right. And that could be why the Alter Rebbe, I think, uh, Igris Hatashuva, I believe, is the name of the next book. Um, that we that we're going to be reading if we do get into there i don't know if we will or not but maybe that's why maybe that's why it is why it's the next part so we've already we started at part two remember this class uh was part two then we went into part one which we're in now and then we go into part three i think which is uh egress hatashuva the letters of uh I think it, I think that's ego. I think that means letters, but the letters of uh, teshuva, of returning, of repentance. Uh, this means that he despises utterly the pleasures of this world, finding it repugnant to derive from them that pleasure which other people derive, namely the pleasure of merely gratifying the physical appetite instead of using this pleasure toward the service of Hashem. Physical pleasures dedicated to serving God are, are, in fact, holy. So, yeah, that could be misread, right? Um, examples would be the pleasure of enjoying the Shabbat with food and drink. It is not such pleasure that is repugnant to the tzaddik, but pleasure for the sake of self-indulgence. That's a better way to phrase it. So things for the sake of like self-indulgence, things for the sake of this world. You want to do things for the sake of uh, the world, to, uh, the, uh, for the sake of heaven. He despises such pleasures, for they are derived from and receive their spiritual sustenance 
from the Klippad and the Sitra Achra, the very antithesis of holiness. The complete Sadiq utterly hates whatever is of the Sitra Achra. And notice how it says whatever is of the Sitra Achra. So things that are derived of the klipa, things that are derived from, of the sitra ahra, souls that are derived from those things, if that makes sense. The reason why I'm pointing it out is, I'm not saying you're not supposed to hate the sitra ahra or whatever, but I'm just saying that this is not the thing that, what he's hating on. James, in the Seistin, uh I can't pronounce it right, sorry, the Tanya here, Yeah. It says on that, what you're talking about now, every person hates what is contrary to that which he loves. Since the Sadiq is love only for God, he adhors what is contrary to it. The Sitra Akra, the other side that is authentical to holiness, such a measure of the heart's desires is not limited to complete Zadokim. In every society and every individual's inner moral scale, are certain things that are simply not done, certain limits that are not to be exceeded, no matter what, things that are utterly despised because they are unethical to everything that society or that the individual understands to be right and desirable. These things are not only done, they are unthinkable. They are not temptuous that need to be resisted because they are so totally abhorred that no possibility of temptation exists. And then it goes on about it I didn't quite understand that last part the, they are unthinkable they Which are not mm -hmm. they are not temptations mm -hmm. that need to be resisted because they are so totally abhorred that no possibility of temptation exists oh uh -huh. And the idea of murdering someone in order to rob him of his money was once unheard of in Israel society. There were thieves, but killing for money was taboo. Today, that boundary has been breached, and Israel society has, so to speak, become receptive to the idea that sex things are possible. People might utterly reject the idea of killing for money, but they no longer feel the horror and the abomination that the very thought once evoked. Because oh. the act entered into the realm of possibility. Oh, and po yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 that's a big point. Well, because once your consciousness, once your consciousness has has uh, thought of it and engaged in thought of it, then you have a, uh, a it'd be, there's a reality associated with it, if only it is in your mind, mm. and, and, and and so therefore. It has a possibility. It has doubt. Has a possibility of existing, and it's not as abhorrent to when it was utterly detestable. Right. The knowledge. This, didn't, didn't we talk about the author? We mentioned something about the tzaddik of knowledge of evil, or something like that. What Russell just said: there are things that people would never do, sins they would never commit. Yet the possibility is on is not unthinkable. The temptation, or at least the thought of doing them, might occasionally arise in their hearts. But for every person, there are certain sins regarding which his heart is utterly pure. Sins he would never even consider as a possibility. This is the way the complete Zedek relates to everything belonging to the sphere that was which is which is unholy in every shape and form. He does not comprehend them. They do not enter his mind. His mind and soul are attend, attuned to what is holy and yearn for God alone. Worldly pleasures of any kind are inconceivable to him, and he fails to understand how they can be conceivable to anyone else. Hmm. Right. That makes sense. <laughs> I've had people say, so. I can't believe they would do that. Why would you even think that's okay to do? You know, I hear that quite a bit. And in their mind, that's true. Yeah, and my my dad says that uh, like a lot. Like, why would anybody do that? That's crazy. <laughs> so, I think we all wonder that, don't well, we? Yeah, <laughs> we do. But I just uh, it's just interesting. Uh, but to the person who's contemplating it, 
Yeah. There's a level of reality to it because yeah. they've already thought about it in their mind. In other words, they already created it in their mind. And yeah. in that, and in that, in that upper world, it, it exists for them. Yeah. And so now it's plausible. It's it's not as uh, unbelievable as it would have been. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the complete Sadiq utterly hates whatever is of the Sitra Akra. And all what is from the Sitra Akra, Sadiq, the complete Sadiq. So I have a question. If they abhor everything of the Sitra Akra, mm -hmm. how much knowledge do they have of that Sitra Akra? To abhor it. I don't know, because if they contemplated it, they wouldn't abhor it. That's right. In the same matter. You see what I mean? If yeah. Once you look into it, once you you think they have to know a lot about it. Uh, but I think maybe, or maybe there's a threshold that you have to pass to where you know, you, you get to a point to where you contemplate it, and then you contemplate it to where it, become, it becomes uh, somewhat reasonable to you. But then you you uh, you contemplate on some more, and it comes back up forward again. And that may be somehow this sequence of, of, of coming into a sin, sinning, and then come uh, uh, doing repentance to Shiva, coming over the sin, and it, it be coming back up forward to you after your repentance. There may be a, a sequence here uh, that we're looking at as a formula to how this psychologically. What the uh, what the altar Rebbe is telling us here is how it's psychologically uh, the uh, of, uh, the sequence of a sadiq works. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting question, and I'm wondering if it has something to do with Torah. Like you read Torah, it follows it. It tells you the path of good and evil, so you're going to have a knowledge of it, right? Yes. And then you know what it smells like. You kind of know where it goes. And maybe you get a sense of it. Something comes up and you're like, whoa, I don't think so. You know, something pops up in your life or whatever. And you're like, whoa, I don't think so. That's crazy. And, uh, but I, I, yeah, I'm wondering if Mercy's onto something there. Maybe because, like, you read Torah, it doesn't necessarily mean you desire the bad thing that you're reading and having knowledge about, though. Well, Torah that, brings it into Torah brings it into existence. Exactly. The possibility there. Yeah, that's why. That's what I'm getting at. Like, you would not know about certain sins unless the Torah taught you about it. You know what I'm saying? Or especially the oral Torah, the midrash, and the lazor, right. where it gets into. You know some sp very specifics, right? Uh, on uh, uh, and the you know and the idea. You know one of the things I heard. You know when you, you know like the Torah or, or the oral Torah comes in and, and uh, will point out you know sins of bestiality, which is horrible to think about it to in enter into your mind. But yet the oral Torah is going to bring that into your mind. But then the Torah goes back and teaches to you why you know why they they killed the animal that was engaged in that act. Right. You know, to kill not only the animal, and that was for you know the reason that no one would ever look upon it and think of the act that was done. Right. So my point is like, yeah, yeah. So like, I I just think that mercy is kind of onto something. Like, there are some things like even in the Talmud. Like, I don't want to. It's just a little too much. A little TMI. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, and I, I, it's a mature. I don't know if it's a maturity issue. But again, it goes back to what Mercy's saying. What makes you mature? What is that? Do you know what yeah, I'm what saying? What is it that that you must have to know so much about that thing to yeah. say, oh no. Yeah, exactly. I, I know what you mean about the Talmud. There's been some things I went, whoa, wait a minute, what am I reading here? You know, yeah. and yeah. And then I, I feel like I need to leave that chamber so to say <laughs> yeah i can out of here <laughs> yeah exactly yeah i know what you're talking about mercy yeah 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 so um yeah it's an interesting conversation that's really interesting uh to resume let's see here i was going over stuff uh 
Oh, because of his great love, a profuse love of delights. So he's overcome by this love of delights. So when he comes across something from the Citra Akra, he's like, no way. So it sounds like I think delights is referred to as food, maybe. Uh, I think we referred, he, the Alter Rebbe talks about that maybe in eight or seven, I forget. Uh, but when it comes to food, like you can smell things and you know that you, based on the food, like, oh, I'm, you know. Now the question is, have you had that before? And that's how you know that that is good or bad, you know? That's where, like, the question that Mercy had kind of goes into play. Or is it based on smell and, like, you can just smell that it's bad and you're definitely not going to eat it? So I don't know. Anyways. Um, and I have a comment on that smell because you just answered something for me. Um, I was under, uh, well, I was wondering how the Mashiach would be able to smell you and know if you, you know, were righteous or not. Right. And I just thought of that now, how it is, because you smell like the food you eat. So if you're not keeping kosher and doing all that, the Mashiach can smell that aspect as because when um, uh, my, um, I'm sorry, my uh, son and, and his wife, you know, they love deer meat and all that kind of stuff. And um, when they would have us up for it, I, I could smell it for days on Jack if he had ate deer meat. Oh, interesting. So that really answers something important for me of how we know how the Mashiach can smell us. He can smell us through what we eat. Hmm. Yeah, I think that has something to do with this. It's a good point. In chapter 9, where the altar of explained that love of delights is the ultimate level in love of God. To resume, because of the Sadiq's great love for God and holiness, he utterly hates. Now, he here, he says he hates the Klippa and Sitra Akra, not just things that are from Klippa and Sitra Akra. Since they, i.e. holiness and Klippa, are antithetical, his love of God therefore evokes a commensurate degree of hatred for Sitra Akra. So here he says he's literally hating, or he's hating the actual Sitra Akra, the actual Klippa. Earlier, he just said it was just the things derived from Klippa and the things derived from Sitra Akra. Does that make sense? Do you see why I'm pointing that out? Maybe it's just me because I'm that type of person, but there's a difference. So I... Um, so it is as so it is written i hate them with a consuming hatred since um oh okay sorry one of my kids got hurt i was making sure they're okay uh so it is written i hate them with a consuming hatred says king david of those who opposed god they have become enemies to me search me he says to god and know my heart this, this means by searching me and knowing how great is the love of you born in my heart, you will know how great is my hatred toward your enemies. For as stated, yes. love is the measure of hate. Hmm. Sounds like we're talking a little bit about our questions. So it does sound like as long, if you know your love for God, if you do love God, if you can sense something is not of God, then therefore you can hate it. Maybe you, maybe there is a way that you can not have to like fully know uh, evil or, or things from the Klippa. Hence, according to the abundance of love toward God, so is the extent of hatred toward the spiritual Sitra Akra, which nurtures the physical pleasures and the utter repugnance of the evil of physical pleasures. Since the Sitra Akra is spiritual and hence distant from physical man, the term hatred is appropriate to it with regard to the evil of physical pleasures, which are closer to man. The term repugnant is applicable. 
the repugnance of having something odious places placed before one's very eyes <clears throat> so yeah i guess my analogy of food was okay for repugnance is as much the exact opposite of love as is hatred In, in any event, we have established that this Sadiq's utter despisal of evil is predicated on his loving God to the greatest degree. He is therefore called a complete Sadiq, since the quality by virtue of which he is termed a Sadiq, i.e. his love of God, is on the highest and most complete level. He is also called a Sadiq who knows only, oh, here we go, a Sadiq who knows only good. So he said that before in Hebrew. He possesses only good, having transformed all the evil within him to do good. Hence, the incomplete Sadiq, whose love of delights is imperfect, must also be lacking in his hatred of evil. This, in turn, indicates that he retains some vestige of evil, albeit un unfelt. He is therefore called a Sadiq who knows evil. So maybe that's kind of what we're talking about. The incom so the incomplete side is a side who just hasn't dealt with those things that he learned that were evil. He hasn't he hasn't been he hasn't dealt properly with that knowledge yet. Maybe. The incomplete side is he who does not hate the Sitra Ahra, the spiritual clipot. Now we're talking about hating, not knowledge. That's what's confusing to me, I guess. The spiritual clipote with an absolute hatred. Therefore, he also does not find evil, physical desires, and pleasures absolutely repugnant. As long as his hatred and abhorrence of evil are not absolute, perforce he must have retained some vestige of love and pleasure toward it. The filthy garments in which the animal soul had been clothed, meaning as explained above, the evil inclination and the lusting after worldly pleasures, have obviously not been completely shed from it. Therefore, too, the evil of the animal soul has not actually been converted. Uh, mamish, to good. Uh, yeah. ne Nepach. Since it will, uh, therefore, too, the evil of the animal soul has not actually been converted, converted to good, since it still has some hold on the filthy garments, i.e., the desires for pleasure in which the animal soul had previously clothed and expressed itself. Except that this vestige of evil is imperceptible and cannot express itself in evil desires, etc., because the evil is nullified in the good. I got to read that again, except that this vestige of evil is imperceptible and cannot express itself in evil desires, etc. Because the evil is nullified in the good by reason of its minuteness and is accounted as nothing. I.e. the overwhelming preponderance of good prevents the evil from being sensed and from finding expression. So it's like maxing out your processor. Your processor is not going to be working on anything. Your your, your CPU can't work 110%. It can only work at 100%. And if the things that it's working on are all good, it has no time, compute power left to work on the bad. Indeed, is this really good here? Okay. What you're, you're on? The evil within him <clears throat> has been silenced, but has not yet been converted into a positive force in his divine service just like the processor you just mentioned mm. it hasn't been converted yeah very good indeed he is therefore called sadik veralo sadik and no e no yeah i don't like which means not only a sadik who knows evil but also a Tzadik whose evil is his, i.e. subjugated and surrendered to him. 
to the good within him. Such a sadiq is identified with the good since he is overwhelmingly good. Perforce, then, the fact that he retains some evil indicates that his love of God is also not complete. So he's subduing his evil, it's subjugated, but it's and surrendered to him, but it's still there. I think that's what, uh, another way of putting it. Indicate that his love of God is also not complete, for a complete love of God would have converted all the evil within him to good. He is therefore called an incomplete sadiq. She'enu gamor. As explained above, the term complete and incomplete denote the sadiq's level of love for God and the terms who knows only good and who knows evil denote the degree of his eradication and transformation of evil. So I guess that's what I'm still confused. Why do they use the term no instead of desire or some such? Because up here he talks about there's still uh, the vestige of evil, therefore he must somehow desire it on some level. He, so, he still desires to uh, feed off the Kalipa for some reason. But this is talking about knowledge. So I don't, I don't understand it. For instance, like, can you read the Torah and still, and have knowledge of evil because the Torah has bad things talked about. And you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Or am I off? Uh, but then, but there's also a difference between desiring that evil, you know, um, now, this level, that of the incomplete Sadiq who knows evil, is subdivided into myriads of levels, consisting of varying degrees and the quality of the minute remaining evil deriving from any of the four evil elements of which the animal soul is composed. So this is talking about the different elements, air, water, uh, fire, things like that. In one sadiq, the remaining evil may consist of the element of water, and another, the evil may consist of a spark of the element of fire, and so on. This subdivision of levels is qualitative based on the type of remaining evil. The Alter Rebbe will now describe, as it were, a quantitative subdivision depending on the degree to which the evil loses its, I its identity within the good. <clears throat> In one sadic, the vestigial evil may be such as the that the proportion of good to evil could be described as 60 to 1. The evil in another sadic may be more my, minute, that is, that it is overwhelmed by a proportion of good that is 1,000 to 1, and so on. Yet to borrow a term from the law concerning non-kosher foodstuffs, where in certain cases of error, I was going to say this is, I thought it was interesting that I was using 60 to 1, such as milk. Uh, the rule is that even a preponderance of 60 parts kosher to one non-kosher is sufficient to render the entire mixture kosher, since the non-kosher food is no longer capable of tainting the mixture with its flavor. Uh, we may likewise say in our case that a preponderance of good over evil to the degree of 60 to 1 is also capable of preventing the expression and perception of the remaining evil. In the Alter Rebbe's words, uh, <clears throat> the subdivision also takes into account the degree to which the remaining evil is nullified in the good because of its minuteness, whether in 60 times as much good, for example, or in a thousand or 10,000 and so on. These various sublevels in the ranks of incomplete Sadiqim are the levels of the numerous Sadiqim found in all generations, all of whom belong to the category of the incomplete Sadiq, as we find in the Gemara. 18,000 Siddiquim stand before the Holy One, blessed be he. Thus, though many attain the level of Sadiq, they are in fact incomplete Siddiquim. James, can, can you yeah. go back up? Sure. Where it was talking about um, uh, the food, the entire mixture of the food being kosher because of the 60 parts to yeah. one. So in other words, flour um wheat yep. flour is considered kosher but there might be a a small little portion of a, a critter that got into the wheat flour but it, it's nullified because the portion of the wheat is much greater than that one little critter was right the non-kosher critter yeah. i'm not going to say that that's a like a like i don't know 
the laws of Kashras, so I can't say that that's what it is, but that's what it sounds like, yeah. Or milk, yeah. I think I've heard this in situations with milk. So, in other words, in regards to this small, minute evil that may still be residing in a tzaddik, it's, is it nullified then at that point the same way as it would be in food substance? Yeah, that's what they're saying. Okay. Yeah, okay. and that's what I'm pretty sure what they're talking about. And I and I else here. Okay. Uh, uh, this is I think this is using an example of the incomplete sadiq. Let's see here. Why it's still called sadiq even though it's incomplete. Uh, James. Yeah. Um, could this have something to do with uh, the uh, the whole idea of the purpose of us being in the physical? is that we're redeeming this stuff, uh, healing this stuff, and we are, that's why we're looking at something that's kosher and non-kosher. That uh, the reason why someone is not quite, or an incomplete tzaddik, I mean, that would be as far as heaven is concerned, surely. But the whole reason uh, is that we're ref refining the particular elements that we have uh, to refine in this physical. I think so, 100%. We're revealing godliness by refining. And I think like food, you know, Mercy was talking about this. You're talking about this. If you've ever dealt with food, like if you're, if you're growing your own food, like this is a thing, like this is a real thing. You want to pick the bugs out of your food. You want to, Make sure you don't have stones mixed in with your wheat um, or your corn or whatever. You don't want because you don't want to be grinding that stuff that, you know, you don't want to be grinding. Or even to um, bite into a fruit, so to say. You oh, want yeah. it open before you eat it, like figs and dates. I mean, in Israel, that was a real big thing. Yeah. Cut it open. Make sure there isn't a, a larva of something inside the fruit. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> 100 percent and i think that's kind of what what's going on here like that teaches us at least that teaches me by working with food by growing your own food uh it teaches you the realities of this kind of stuff and we're supposed to be not all, not just elevating but uh, revealing because when we elevate it, it like has an element of revelation to it and that's the whole purpose, the sole purpose of, uh, um, of the nefesh elokis, the godly soul, is to reveal godliness, to refine the nefesh behemoth, the things that are from Klippat Noga. Can I make a comment on Marcy's comment? Sure. Uh, about the larva and stuff being in them and why you need to get the bugs out? Yeah. It's because when you eat that, it affects your health. Because it can it can damage your intestines, or it can cause you to have I hate to say it, but worms or things in your body, and that you know I mean it's a very deep it goes very deep. It's not just getting bugs out; it's because it's for health, it's for and, life. And uh, exactly, and I also think too it teaches us to pick apart what's within us. If we can pick apart what's within. Uh, something else that's created for us to consume, we should be able to pick apart ourself as well. Yes, excellent. Yeah. Very good, Mercy. Very yeah. Good. Yeah, because yeah. because uh, mm -hmm. ourselves, our animal souls, they derive from Klippat and Noga and things that are permissible to us, things yeah. like fruit and like like uh, like Dixie was talking about. We we can uh, refine and extract things that derive from that klipot no ga. So, like Dixie was talking about, you have an apple. Well, it's a mitzvah to not eat insects. So when you're picking out your insects, yeah, of course there's beneficial aspects to the health aspects, but uh, there's there's health aspects to it. But when uh, when the Shem says don't eat bugs. And he's saying abstain from the completely impure klipa, which would be, I would assume, bugs because it's a negative part of a negative commandment. But it's permissible to eat fruit, so you're separating the 
the things that are derived from the three completely impure klepa and you're separating it out from the klep the things that are derived from the klepa noiga which would be like the uh apple the, the actual right. good parts of the apple right you're learning to master how to extract the nitsotso yeah so right mm -hmm. yeah and, and like dixie was saying that stuff can actually manifest into being harmful now don't get me wrong we don't want to do it just because it, it's it's biologically beneficial and we want to abstain because it's biologically not beneficial but it's a mitzvah but the thing is like those can be used are as examples those that biology can be used as an example heaven forbid you get worms or uh you know uh whatever so um and forgive me i shouldn't have said worms i should have said parasites it yeah well like it, yeah it could be either like right um uh, generally we're not gonna well here's the thing like generally <laughs> the bugs that are on fruit they're probably actually not going to give you it's it's a different it's for a different species like it's probably not going to be propagated but now if you're with uh something that's more closely related to humans like pigs you you generally want to stay away from parasites of omnivores um because they they there's a good chance they will cross, you know, hop onto you and do something, do some damage to you. Um, well, Baruch Hashem for ivermectin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Amen. Let's see here. Uh, it's interesting, all those big numbers we were reading in the Mead Bar was a week ago like 18,000. I wonder if you use those to divide, you get some, you might find some interesting information. Um, You're going too far down, James. But am I, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you, Teresa. Wasn't there a footnote, I think? me on track. Footnote five. Footnote five. Yeah. Isn't that it right there? Paraphrase from Suka 45B and Sanhedrin 97B. Okay. Very good. So yeah, we stop right there. Uh, how much? I wonder if we should. Uh, yeah, or should we stop or just continue on? We don't have. Well, there's quite a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go ahead and. I think we got another at least twenty minutes, so maybe we should take a break. <clears throat> Okay, well, we just finished up with the incomplete Sadiq. So I think that incomplete Sadiq, I think this is still the incomplete Sadiq. I might need to verify that with somebody, but I think this 60 to 1 ratio, we're talking about the incomplete Sadiq. They're still called, it's still called mm -hmm. kosher. They're still called it Sadiq, but they're just the incomplete kind. They're still learning to pick themselves apart. <laughs> Yeah. Either I, that I or it's like it's it's functional. Like yeah. you can function. You're not you're not bringing the klepa into uh physicality. You're not enclosing it. It's only resides in you internally. You're not you're not manifesting it in other words. You're not manifesting the, the the citra opera. Um yeah. I have a quick question. So the 60, 40, so if you're above the 60, then you're in trouble. But if you're under the 60 and you're at the 60, 40, then you are a sodic but incomplete. But if you go above that, like you're 50, 50 or something like that, you're in trouble. Oh, I see what we're saying. Yeah, the 50, 50, which would be, well, 50, 50 would be one to one. But um this ratio is your break-even point. You want okay. this left side number ratio to be higher than 60. 60 or higher. 60 equal to 60 or greater is good, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, lesser than 60. And I'm talking, I'm not, <laughs> he's, the, the alter, the, the Rebbe is actually quantifying this and he's using Talmud for the law of kosher, the laws of uh, kosher. 
as an example. So uh, 60 parts kosher to one part non-kosher. So you mm -hmm. want to have, you want to make sure your parts are higher than six, uh, 60 or greater. Okay. Uh, so he, but he's using this. I don't know if it's actual literal. I don't know if he's using an example to be literal. I, um, but he's given this as an example. Now, in in reality, literally, when it comes to laws of kosherus, keeping kosher and the laws of kosher, I think this applies. I'm don't I'm I'm not a rabbi, so I'm just saying this. But like, let's say you have. 60 parts you have 60 cups of um um kosher milk and you have one cup of non-kosher milk you mix it all together and i'm pretty sure the whole thing is still considered kosher now if you had 50 59 parts of kosher and you mixed in one cup of non-kosher with the 59 parts that were kosher of milk I believe the whole thing is considered non-kosher. I think well, that's how that works. James, one of the one of the examples is used. Uh, say you are you have a pot of stew, uh -huh. and you're holding your baby, and, and that's holding a milk bottle, and the and the baby tips the bottle over, and drops fall into your meat soup uh -huh. stew. As long as it's not more than an olive's amount, size of an olive amount, yeah, then it's still kosher. He's nice. So an olive amount is a is a rule of measurement when it comes to eating. Like uh, it's it's a it's an amount that is considered like uh, a consumption. If you're if you're going to eat a meal, it has to be a he's nice. Uh, which I believe that's the pronunciation of it, but uh, the size of an olive that's considered a meal. But Rabbi Ananada that. talked about that before. But that's just for the Jew because the Jew has merit, uh, he has the merit of his forefathers. The non Jew doesn't have merit. That's true. So if he eats one granule of a limb of the living animal, he's he, he's uh, he's uh. Uh, not kept that uh, well what's a non-Jew though it's probably well, talking about a is, joy whatever you know, it's, it's somebody that doesn't have merit of Jewish forefathers yeah. well here's the thing I would argue that we only have merit <laughs> in other words we're not commanded we're here based on merit do you see what I'm saying I'm not I'm not be i'm not trying to be mean or anything i'm trying to create i'm trying to trying to create, create an yeah. argument but the 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 we are here based on merit that's actually it's actually the jewish people that could it could be argued that they don't really have merit they're just doing things as, as they're being commanded to do because of the merit of avram if that makes sense and well, they could or the merit of keeping torah yeah they were commanded to do right well that's they, a, have, they have that merit of doing it right and that's a, even a bigger merit in my opinion than being mitsuva vaose but what i'm saying is when people say that they there's no merit among non-jews i believe when you look in the hebrew is it's talking about merit of goyim or akum and i and i i that every single time i hear somebody say non-jew about quoting the torah it's just about 99 percent of the time it's talking about the goy the the akum which is what we talked about last week basically yeah, which yeah. Is a, so when somebody says there's no merit like i feel like that's only what we have as non-jews in torah is we only have merit because we were not commanded it was from birth like we did not we were not taught the Torah from birth. We, it was up to us like Avraham, literally like Avraham to come out of a Zarah. When, when I read the stories of Avraham, I completely connect with those stories. Um, like, I'm like, Oh my goodness. It, it like reminds me of uh, being a child, like being a kid. And, and 
growing up in a Votazara. And I, I totally um, um, how do I want to put it? I see my path a lot like the path of Avraham. And I think a lot of people here would too. Like, I'm not saying I'm righteous like Avraham, uh, but when it comes to the path, a very similar path, in my opinion. And um, I just feel like if somebody says there's no merit, that's like a slap in the face. Uh, everybody here, I think, have been through a lot when it comes to friends and family and trying to make a stand for Torah and Hashem when we did not have those things that Yisrael has, we did not have a connection with Torah. We did not have a community that helped us directly. We had to go through this world in a state of sojourning and gears and going from oasis to oasis to oasis in a land you know in a 99 you know percent of the world was like a desert to us and uh i don't know that's just how i feel yeah it. well i mean that's that you know i can understand all that yeah. but, you know that's that's the rabbinical teaching of it is that, that to make the explanation of why is it an olive weight for for one person that and, and there's no olive weight for Whatever it is, there uh, yeah. the Hasidim mot Allah. There's no description of having that leniency because of the merit of their forefathers. Right, but there is leniency in things when you're connected with Torah. When you have Kabbalah of Torah, you have Rachmanim, you have Rachmanus, and you have mercy and you have kindness. Um, but but the non-Jew goy, the goy who is not do who that does not have Kabbalah, they are Eno Mitsuviv, Eno Ose, they are not commanded and they don't do. Uh even maybe even uh, you could arguably say the Stam ben Noach, because they are not they don't have Kabbalah of Torah. They might do the seven, but they don't do them because the Torah says so. When you're not connected with Torah there's not going to be mercy. That's why everything for the Ben Noah is hive Misa worthy of death. Everything's super harsh. But then what happens when you get into the seven mitzvahs, when the Torah says so, now you get into kindness. Now you get into mercy. Now, if you accidentally kill a uh, manslaughter, somebody on the side of the road, heaven forbid, you do not have to be killed right away. Like you would with the laws of Ben Noah you are now in the the mercy of torah because the torah is chesed now you can run to a city of refuge and have your case pleaded uh, and things like this when you have that kabbalah when you have kabbalah you are entering a new world you're entering a new malchus and it's not the malchus of the goyim is it the malchus of israel then yes 100 percent is the malchus of hashem that's why when you say a, when you say a blessing, Baruch Ata Adonai Aluhenu, Melech Haolam, King of the World. You're not saying King of. You're not saying this is my King of the Goyim, or you know what I'm saying, like uh, a king, like uh, Obama or Trump or whoever. They're not your king. Hashem is your king. When you with the proper, when you have Kavana and you say Hashem. You are my king. You are the king of this world. You are now not a goy. You are no longer under that category anymore because that's the definition of a goy. They're under the kings and the angels and those principalities that Hashem set up as a as a backside thing. You don't want me as king here. Make your own king using these elements, these four elements. I'm going to create a king for you because you don't want to deal with me. You're going to deal with my creation and you're going to worship that creation. And that's what a goy is. And so when, when you hear 95, 99% of the time you hear about somebody say the non-Jew and Torah, they're talking about those types of non-Jews. They're under the Kings of the world. They're under the angels that Hashem put in place and they worship those things. That's what a goy is. There's 70 of them. And um, 
they're all derived from the permutations of the lower seven sephiro. So, James, would you please go over the four? Um, I'm sorry, my mind just slipped. The four elements, please. Um, so, a shem. How do I put this? Um, we we studied it. It's kind of slipping my mind. The the um, is it the klepa are derived from the four elements, or the four elements are derived from the klepa? So the the ophanim Hashem Hashem has a, a certain level of angels that use these elements. And I forget how it is put and how it is stated, but the these angels, their faces are of these elements, mm. and they have and and they they not permute they emanate from from all this, mm. and and it's from there from that's what the klepa comes from. And that's where the these souls derive from. So our animal souls are derived from this these types of klepa, and that's why our uh, emotions. That's why people, certain people, or just everybody, but they have certain types of traits to them. Some people are really fiery, and you know. Um, just very passionate about things some people are more like air where they um they speak a lot and they um maybe are very spiritual and good with their speech there are people that are uh that are more attuned to the element of earth and they are um face to the ground uh nose to the grindstone and they they just work a lot and then the citra akra of that, or the 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 negative, uh, when when the person that's from the uh, uh, element of earth does the uh, negative of that, they are slothful. The person that's does the negative of air instead of speaking Torah, they speak lashon hara. Um, um, it's I think it's talked about water. People that are from water are more connected with chesed. But when they do things that are in that are on the backside, they they have problems with like sexual immorality, um, or maybe that's a fire. I forget. Uh, maybe fire. Maybe they're connected with uh, lashing out. Maybe they're violent physically or something like that. Um, but those our animal souls are derived from permutations and com combinations of these elements. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I think the Alter Rebbe talks about that more. Well, he talks about that more in different books of Hasidus. And he touches on that in, um, I think it's chapters one and two of this Lucute Amarim, of this actual part. But my point is when when our souls are removed from the godly soul and we only focus on the mido the animalistic and emotional character traits and we're just out to have a good time or to feed those emotions then we're deriving our sustenance or at least we think we're deriving our sustenance from those things oh i gotta go out and do this oh i gotta got, go out and get that your soul is feeding off of those things those are your that's your king that's where you get your sustenance from it's like you know so but when you have that revelation the higher revelation the revelation of torah revelation of hashem and you say hashem is my king melech haolam king of the world melech king haolam the world, you are the king of this concealment. You now realize you have this awakened epiphanous state of mind now where you're like, oh, there's something beyond this world. There are things beyond this concealment. 
Hashem is my king of those things. And now you're moving beyond this world. You are no longer a goy at that point. You are now what's called gerus. You're starting that, that gerus process with a nefesh elokis, with a godly soul. I'm not saying you're a convert. I'm not, I'm not using those bastardized terms. And I'm not going to. I'm going to use Hebrew kosher terms. That's gerus. Does that mean Yisrael is going to accept you as a ger? No. Does that mean they have to? No. Because in the just reality and physicality through just legal terms, just because somebody says there's something to you doesn't mean they actually are. So just because you might call yourself a ger, you're living the life of a ger, doesn't mean Yisrael necessarily sees that about you or you're at a level to where they can now accept you and have what, what would be called the union. Does that make sense? So like I, somebody bursts into my house and says, Hey, I think I'm going to marry your daughter. Well, that's a big thing. You're going to have to prove it. I'm going to tell the guy to get lost. It's the same kind of concept. <clears throat> Just because we call ourselves the gear or we're going through garris doesn't mean necessarily mean that Yisrael is going to accept us. So that's kind of kind of the thing. Now are there things that they probably should be accepting us on today? Yes. Like we went over that last week, like laws of Sadaka. Things like that. Like pretty obvious things in my opinion. But because Yisrael is so otherworldly there could be things that are very obvious staring them in the face and they're just not going to accept it. That's just the type of people they are. They're going to try their best to keep the Torah. I'm not saying that they do it the way that I would think that I would think is correct in this aspect, but nonetheless, that's what, that's what's kept them alive. That's what kept them spiritually alive with the Torah. You know, if we were able to convince them otherwise, then they would have left Torah. There's very powerful emotional forces in the world. And so, thank God they didn't subdue to that, because if they did, then there would probably be no existence of Torah today. So they, they're kind of doing their part. Uh, but at the same time, I do have in certain issues that we talked about last week, which I don't want to get into. I don't want to waste people's time. Uh, we've already had people drop off class that's going a little long in the tooth. But the the non-Jew, there's different types of non-Jews. So to say that non-Jews don't have a merit is just, that's heartbreaking to hear. You know, it just breaks my heart every single time I hear stuff like that. Like, so... Whenever somebody says non-Jew and they're talking about in the Torah, they're not quoting Torah because nowhere in Torah does it say Eino Yehudi, non-Jew. There's always <laughs> some type of, some subtype of non-Jew it's talking about. So just ask for, ask for clarification. What does it say in the Hebrew, Rabbi? What kind of non-Jew? Oh, it just means all non-Jews, the Goy, non-Jew. Okay, 99% of the time it is, it's going to say Goy. It's not going to say non-Jew. It's going to say goy, which is the akum. So, and what is the akum? It's you know, what is the idolater? What is the goy? It's someone who is involved in this type of idolatry. They they worship things that are derived from these elements, from the klipa, from from the vision of uh, I think is uh, Yehezkiel. Um, the the faces of the ox and things like that. Those are the souls that are derived from. <clears throat> that klipa. So, um, so I think. Well, Jenny, uh, what that... about the people, the rabbis that will really accept it, but in secret, because they don't want to be shunned by the they're, other rabbis? Yeah. So, so they're under duress. They're under coercion. We are all living in a world of coercion right now. <clears throat> and I think you need to have mercy on those rabbis. Uh, uh, work with them in secret. Don't expose them because they will get attacked and they will be eliminated. Oh, yeah. Physically yeah, or spiritually. That. Like they will get shunned mm -hmm. from their community or whatever. 
Um, and it's not because all all Jews are going to believe that. It's because there are some that I would honestly think it's a small amount, but that think think differently and but they're powerful or whatever and it's just a bad spirit because i've looked at the text and there's nowhere that says the things that they are saying they're misquoting what the sages are saying and it irks me greatly when i hear somebody misquote torah and it'd be different if i was just saying this like as a somebody didn't know torah never read it before and it's just my opinion it's not they're literally momish misquoting torah no ben noach she'asek betoa hive misa ben noach that's worthy of death or ben noach that is deeply involved in torah studies worthy of death no doesn't say that anywhere in torah it never says ben noach what's that talking about it says goy akum what's a goy what's an akum whenever you hear that and you ask that question they're going to say well goy just means non-jew where does it say that, Rabbi? Oh, it's just culturally. What are you talking about? I'm a rabbi. You got to pay attention to what I'm saying. No, just ask them. Culturally, do you, are, are is, is Torah defined by culture, or should culture be defined by Torah? Where does it say that a goy means all non-Jews? Nowhere in Torah does it say that. On the contrary, you have sages that say, like the Rambam, in all places where I write stam goy, plain goy, I'm talking about the idolater, the akum. The Rambam explicitly says that. Why they don't follow that, I have no clue. The Ritba says it explicitly. What is the goy? Someone who is not careful in the seven. The seven mitzvot b'nei noach. He's not careful. I ben noach is not commanded and does but he does the, he is 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 not commanded in the seven because he doesn't have kabbalah but he's doing the seven in other words he's still in the nations he hasn't had that revelation of kabbalah of that of hashem but he's doing the seven because they're moral he thinks are the right thing to do based on his own understanding and then you have somebody called the ger toshav ger toshav has kabbalah he does the seven is careful in them Oh, you can't. There's no Gerto Shab today. You've heard that how many times? What do you mean there's no Gerto Shab? Well, then that means I can't be doing the seven because Torah, because the Torah says so, because Hashem says so. Oh, but you got to do the seven. I really want you to do the seven because Hashem says to do them because the Torah says so. Well, you just told me that the Gerto Shab doesn't exist today. And they're misquoting Torah. There's no place in the Torah that says Gerto Shab do not exist. What it says is that they are not accepted today by Yisrael. And where is because there's no Yovel. Therefore, they're not completely accepted. It'd be like I can't accept the presidency because I, I didn't receive all my electoral votes. I've got 99% of them, but I didn't receive all of them. Whatever. Okay, so you're not at the status of president. Similar concept. Does that mean that I'm not a you know majority of people in the united states didn't like me does that mean i can't give sadaka how how many rabbis do you know that take sadaka from non-jews well guess what they're <laughs> treating you like a gear toshav <clears throat> they're not treating you like the goy so if they're if they call you a goy well then show them they'll hope malachim 10 10 you're not supposed to be you're not supposed to be keeping that sadaka if you think i'm a goy if you keep calling me a goy you're not supposed to be keeping my tzedakah. It's just a weird, I don't, I don't get it. I just don't get it. And this is Peshat. This is literal, uh, very simple understanding of, of non-Jews and Torah. This is the non-Jewish sugi. I don't understand where they get their information from because it's just Peshat from the Hebrew. So, Is it Halakha, James? Is yeah. it their Halakha that they have made up? Yes, it is made up halakha. They it literally is not from the Torah. It is literally is not. It's just they. In other words, <clears throat> the whole the whole crux of the matter is that culturally a goy means all non Jews. So when they come across goy in halakha, they translate that in their mind as all non Jews. It is very very hard to overcome that cultural issue 
to go into the Torah and then have the Torah define what a non-Jew is. They just can't believe it for whatever reason. And when I say they, I'm talking about, I would say 80, 90% of, uh, of rabbis I come, come across. The funny thing is, you don't want to hear something really crazy. The funny thing is most of the Yisrael that I come across, most of the Jews that I come across that, that totally agree with what I'm saying, they're like, well, that's why I'm not practicing Judaism. They're mm -hmm. not practicing Jews. Like I just, I felt like something was wrong when in regards to non-Jews. And they didn't want to be a part of it, whatever. I'm not saying that's right, that they didn't go further and actually look further in what the Torah actually said. I wish they did, but I feel like I'm doing a bit of tikkun on that because they, they actually get back into Torah a little bit. But mm -hmm. it's just, I don't know what's going on. It's just crazy to me. It's like that gula, the ghoul is happening, and I just feel like a lot of people are missing it. They're missing out uh, on what they should be doing. And um, I'm trying my best to, to get get it out. And uh, it's just really weird, really weird. And it's not You're me saying You're doing a really it. good job. But you I know, appreciate I, it. I know something happened on new moon that just really has upset me hmm. um again it's uh because a convert wasn't converted with their uh with the rabbis that can the rabbi that converts the kabod they won't accept the converts that aren't converted by certain rabbis and it's just so upsetting to me because the scripture says, once you're a convert, you are a Jew. It doesn't say you can pick the rabbis that convert them. And it just blew me away. It's just so upsetting to me that, that the halakha can be so that only their rabbis can convert people, nobody else. So all these thousands of Jews that haven't been converted by that particular sect of rabbis. Oh, right. It's, well, it's yeah, crazy. that's that's a bigger issue, which is like who accepts the base then, then, oh. and uh, like in other words, what what then? It 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 also means that there's no machlokas, there's no um, there's no uh, disagreement among rabbis, and everybody just agrees because you can't go against uh, what a rabbi <clears throat> says or some such. Um, and, uh, that's why I don't have, I, at least I try not to, <clears throat> but I, I try to have a source. I try to have a source for everything that I I'm saying, because if I find the source and it's not really me saying it, um, it's the sages. So if somebody disagrees with what I'm saying, really, they're disagreeing with what a sage says. And, um, it's just yeah i don't know i we're still recording it's it's probably about an hour and 50 in the class right now i um but yeah it's very very, very troubling we could have gaula yisrael could be the leaders of literally the nations um like devarim 28 says uh and instead we're getting blowback from quoting bombish the Peshat of of Torah in regards to non-Jews. Uh, <clears throat> so I, it's very frustrating, but um, I feel like people are waking up uh, a bit to it. So that's all I can uh, hope for. Just do my, you know, do my utmost. James, I think this goes deeper, so much deeper than what we're discussing. It yeah. goes so deep into the, like, the war now the United yeah. States. oh yeah 100 percent. it's, it's all part so, of yeah it's all part of the whole big picture it, it is where, yeah it really is and i hate um a lot of times the thing that i see uh i i can't it's hard uh for me because it's like watching a train wreck i feel like i'm watching a spiritual mm -hmm. train wreck and I'm trying to shout at people. I'm trying to, and it's just not, 
it uh, I think it affects some people. I'm able to like help some people, but I feel like I'm watching a uh, uh, just this huge train wreck as big as the world that involves everybody. And but at the same time, I feel like in the end, it really is going to be a purification process. It really is. We I think we're in a big purification process. All this evil stuff that is going on in the world, they are not going to be procreating. Uh, and there's mm -hmm. going to be a huge like cleansing process, basically, where we're going to have to go through some very, very hard times. It's one of the reasons why I got into plumbing rather than going back into computers. Um, it is, uh, everybody needs, everybody's going to need pure water and everybody's going to need a place to dump their dirty water. So <clears throat> I have to go down to that level, but that's just the, the, the level that I have to go to like the lowest level, so to speak, uh, to, to be able to survive this, I think. And it Everybody might not happen. Can't. It might not happen in my generation, but. And, and and teaching Torah is the really the key. That's really why we do the things that we do because we want to teach and and um, study and teach Torah as much as possible, so we can create a a community of people who um, have the plan, so to speak, which is the Torah. And James. Uh, you know, you going back to plumbing, we all have to go back to our basics now right. because everything, there's so many computer people. There's so, they, they're so overflowing with this. 100%. So these people do not <laughs> even know how to plant a garden, how to dig a hole. Right. We're, we're going to end up, they're going to end up having to go back to the basics of life. 100%. And so us, <clears throat> us of us that have the abilities to know what the basics are, are the ones that have hopefully make it through. I think so. <clears throat> I 100% agree with you. <clears throat> and all these higher levels that are, that are <clears throat> like these value added type things like computers, they're going into just silly stuff like uh, AI and, you know, making cute cat videos on the internet, whatever. Um, they're, it's it's going to create a hierarchy and it is creating a hierarchy that people are going to be dependent on. <clears throat> and I just don't think that, yeah, I eventually see that crumbling. It's going to eventually be used more and more for totalitarian purposes. <clears throat> and um, even the workers, the people that work on those systems are going to be coerced into doing the will of the, to the totalitarians. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually it will come crashing down and we're seeing it now with population decrease because <clears throat> the, the world global population is decreasing and these people that have these beliefs and these ideas, they are eventually going to die off and their, their uh, progeny are going to die. <clears throat> so, but I think this is the process that we kind of have to go through. Um, so uh, yeah. all righty well uh we'll leave it there <clears throat> and we'll start back up halfway through chapter 10 here <clears throat> thank you james for well, being patient with me and oh no <clears throat> thank you thank you dixie thank you mercy and uh russell and Teresa. and yeah. uh i appreciate it uh see you guys next week Hey, James. Yeah, Lila Toe. Lila Toe. Just on a on a side note, uh, Olam comes from a word Helen, which means concealment. Yeah, one hundred percent. Fascinating. Yeah, one hundred percent. That's wow. uh, Rashi on uh, Rashi on Exodus uh, three fifteen, and oh. then it talks in then into Hasidus. And uh, we talked more about that. I don't know if you were in our classes, but uh, the Hasidic Umot Olam, the Umot Olam, anywhere where it says Olam, I basically read now as concealment. Pretty fascinating. Because, yeah, yeah. And I one, one of the cool things we learned in Hasidus is that the Nefesh Elokis, I thought it only resided in the Seichel, the intellect. 
but we're learning from these last few chapters that there's there's a, a portion of the nefesh elokis that or the whole no 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 there's a portion of the heart that the nefesh elokis also resides on the godly soul also resides on which is in the heart that right chamber why is this important because there are non-jews or people in the world that do not have the intellectual knowledge of torah they lived a life with no intellectual knowledge of torah they lived on an island somewhere or whatever but because the nefesh elokis not just resides on the intellect but also the heart this i believe is where the 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 more um, detailed mechanics of haside omoto alam come into play those yeah. kind ones, the kind peoples, the kind ones of the peoples of the world that receive a portion of the world to come, they mm -hmm. they emanate from this klipa snoiga as well. They can they can elevate because mm -hmm. they have that in their heart. But what's cool about that is because it does not matter what you're this is gonna sound crazy, but it doesn't really matter what you're doing. It matters whether that is in your heart or not. In other words, why are they called Hasidei Umoto Alam, the kind ones of the peoples of the world? Because the peoples of the world are doing a Vodazara. Right, and the kind ones are being concealed. Yes, the kind ones are in that concealment of a Vodazara. <clears throat> but because that's all they know, they are captives in that a Vodazara. Mm. And why, what happens when those captives of the Vodazara come into Torah? They have Kabbalah. So they were, they were bittle to the kindness, even though they were in the Vodazara, they were still bittle to the Chesed and they receive a portion of the world to come, but they have an element of bittle to them. When they come to Torah, they have an element of bittle to Torah. And this is Hilchot Malachim 8, 10 through 11, which is what the Rambam says when they accept the seven. That's how Yisrael knows. That's Then they are called They are called then from the kind ones of the peoples of the world. In other words, it appears to me that they it's elevated. saying... Elevated. Yes, exactly. They elevated into another concealment yeah. is what happened. Well, they elevated out of the concealment. They're now Gerus in Torah. They're now Gering in Torah. Yeah, but if you think about it, that is a concealment of its own kind. Well, it could be because it's the enclosed, it's an enclosing of Hashem's wisdom. Right, exactly. Wow. So what you do is you keep on studying it. You become oh, oisek in it. When you become oisek in it, then you're you're truly <clears throat> you're mamish interacting with the godly soul, which is truly a part, a chalik of Hashem, a portion of Hashem, as chapter one talks about. Mm -hmm. This is this is our pattern. This is who we are as non-Jews, I believe. This is our pattern. We have come out of the Avodazara. We're coming into Torah. We have Kabbalah of Torah. We've accepted Torah, and now we're trying to refine and do it. Does that mean we're Gert Sadiqim? Does that mean we're like righteous converts? We have accepted tar Tariag mitzvahs, and we're doing all of it? No. But we're growing in it. We're refining ourselves in it. It might take generations. It might take Gilgulim of our souls, so to speak. <clears throat> but we're doing it. We're refining it. Does that mean Yisrael will accept us? No, it doesn't mean Jews will accept us. We're kind of on our own. But Avraham was on his own. Mm -hmm. We're walking, we're literally walking the path of Avraham, in my opinion. Oh, man. And then this is what we what we're doing. Like this really is. So it, it just, you know, <clears throat> frustrates frustrates me when we get told that like just blank face that oh no you're goyim oh but you're good goyim it's like you don't even know what you're talking about and uh it's just very frustrating because they mean well they're usually very nice whoever it is is saying it they mean well but they just literally haven't looked in the text then not only that they haven't answered the basic axiomatic question which is what is a goy instead they refer to it by culture well i don't want 
somebody defining Torah by culture. That's why I left the Vodazara. If I wanted to be defined by my culture, I would still be in Catholicism or whatever. Just do what you're told, James. Don't care about what the Torah says. Just do what we do and you'll be fine. <laughs> no. And everybody, everyone here has done that. Just everyone hold here on is, to the seat seat and you're good. <laughs> yeah, but no, but everybody's everybody here has went through that. And I don't I don't understand the hang up when you know just because you see uh, somebody who tells you i've got the authority or whatever I'm like no just the torah is the authority listen to what it what it's saying and um because those rabbis who wrote you know what the sages wrote what the torah says that's what i should be that's what's defining me that's what i'm trying to make define me and uh it's done done that my whole life so why would I let a culture define now my belief? It's like, no, we just, we have to keep on refining ourselves using the Torah. And uh, am I a tzaddik? No. Am I perfect in that? No. But let's try for the love of God, please. Let's, mm-hmm. let's Take to heaven. try. Yes. Try our best. There's that, the last samurai movie with that famous actor. He's standing on the hill and they're about ready to die in this war, the samurai against the uh the the guys who got all the guns because the samurai don't have guns and they know they're gonna the suffer. westerners yeah the, yeah exactly <laughs> that converted the japanese to become yes 100 <laughs> percent. and he says what you have to do is just do your utmost like do your utmost i forget the exact phrase he uses but like you have to do your utmost does that mean i'm going to be a uh, gert sedek does that mean i'm going to be accepted into yisrael when they know doesn't mean that it means what i'm doing here in my life right now with the things around me with the people around me i have to uplift all those things and reveal godliness with everything that it is that i do does that mean that i do that no but i try i want to do it i teach others to try and do it like my kids and i've been better off because of that like it's it's actually works Mm -hmm. And so it's just frustrating, but at the same time, I think uh, things will work out. Things are working out, I think. So it's just, yeah. Well, you're it's definitely hard. making a difference because yeah. of doing the teaching and doing what you're doing and reaching out. Yeah. So you're definitely making a difference. And by putting these teachings on YouTube, it's huge. Yeah. There's so many people that can watch yeah. them. Yeah. And even though I'm not like, say, like I'm going to put, the, I'm going to put this up tonight. Is am I perfect in what it is? Everything that I'm saying, no. But I'm going to put put it up there because one day somebody like me is going to need to hear what it is I'm talking about, so they can pick up, pick up where I left off or whatever. And that's part of the refine refining process, in my opinion. Well, so. even so, it's not just the garim that are having to be refined, but it's even you know the jewish nation and and the rebbies right. that are involved as well you know there might right. be a rebbe that comes along and says hey wait a minute here right who is this you know yeah. what, what is this teaching well how did i miss this i need to investigate this more yeah 100 percent. and i you know i run into that i'm not going to drop names because i want to protect those rabbis mm-hmm. but I've, I've 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 talked to about one a week for the past two months or so mm-hmm. uh my, maybe maybe less but this it's just mm-hmm. something's going on where i don't know if people are watching my videos and are looking into it further or something 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 is connecting we're connecting we are connecting with people um let's put it that way so mm-hmm. amen. well i mean i i'm uh, thank you guys for thank you girls for uh, gals for staying with me uh <laughs> <laughs> but i appreciate it and um all God willing, we'll we'll see everybody next week, and I really enjoy these classes. I do feel like we're making progress. I okay. do get frustrated a bit, but I feel like we, I, I do see that we are making progress. So we're I've making had, progress. Yep, yep, we really are. I think we really are bringing Gaul. I do believe Gaul is here, mm-hmm. and I believe that's one of the reasons why we're kind of frustrated, you know, have a hard time sometimes, but all righty. <laughs> okay, Lila Tove. Thank Lila you, Tov. James. Good night. Take care. Thank you, James. Bye, Lato. Bye, Lato.